Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of the Apple Store. This topic won second place in last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed, that way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know what video you'd like to see next. But before we begin, I want to tell you guys about this giveaway iMobi is doing since they were kind enough to sponsor this video. An iPad and Google Home are up for grabs and you can find a link in the description to enter the giveaway for a chance to win. They're doing this to promote their new AnyTransfer cloud service that can manage all your cloud accounts like Google Drive and iCloud from one application. It's also very handy for syncing files across different cloud accounts and sending files to recipients that are too large for email. So if you want to enter the giveaway, click the link in the description and you'll find the directions. Now, Apple's retail stores are the most financially successful in the world, generating more than $5,500 per square foot of retail space. But this level of success was not anticipated by anyone back in 2001 when Steve Jobs debuted the first Apple store. And you may wonder why that was. Well, it's because Apple had tried establishing a retail presence before, but it ended badly. So let's start off by examining why Apple's first attempt at retail failed, while their second attempt was a wild success. Success. Back in 1997, Steve Jobs returned to Apple and found the company in terrible shape, including their retail presence. For many years, Apple had been establishing store within a store concepts, where a section of a retail store like Best Buy would be dedicated to Macintosh computers. But there were some fundamental problems with this approach. Most retail store staff had no training or experience with Macs, so they often directed customers to PCs instead. Also, the reseller's profit margin on selling Macs was only around 9% so they weren't incentivized to recommend them to customers. So with all these problems with the store within a store approach, you might assume that Apple scrapped the idea and began working on their own retail stores. But that wasn't the case. Instead, Apple continued to toy around with the store within a store and focused most of their resources on building an online store. Now, Apple's decision to create an online store instead of improving their retail stores may sound a bit counterintuitive, but there is some backstory here. You see, the reason why Jobs was able to return to Apple is because they purchased Next, a computer company Jobs founded shortly after being forced out of Apple. And some of the technology developed by Next was used to build Dell's successful online store. And when Dell's CEO, Michael Dell, was asked how he would fix Apple, he said, I'd shut it down and give the money back to the shareholders. And this angered Jobs very much. So he assembled a team of Apple and Next employees to build an online store that would be better than Dell's. On November 10th, 1997, Steve Jobs announced the online store at a press event and said, I guess what we want to tell you, Michael, is that with our new products and our new store and our new build to order manufacturing, we're coming after you, buddy. Apple generated $16 million in revenue from its online store in the second quarter of 1998, shortly after it launched. By 2006, Apple was generating millions in revenue every day from the online store. In fact, the online store team used to compete against the retail store team to see which achieved more sales. The two were neck and neck for years, and this sent a clear signal to Apple that the demand for a retail Apple store definitely existed, they just had to figure out an approach that would work best. Tim Cook, who joined Apple in 1998 as Senior Vice President for Worldwide Operations, announced that Apple would cut some channel partners that may not be providing the buying experience Apple expects. We're not happy with everybody. Cook cut ties with every big box retailer, including Sears, Best Buy, Circuit City, Computer City, and Office Max, to focus its retail efforts with CompUSA. Between 1997 and 2000, the number of Mac authorized resellers dropped from 20,000 to just 11,000. At that point, Apple could focus their retail efforts on CompUSA, expecting their hands on approach to help increase Mac sales. And while sales did increase slightly, the store within a store concept still didn't meet Apple's expectations expectations, partly because the Apple section was in the lowest traffic area of CompUSA stores. Apple added Best Buy as a second authorized reseller, but challenges still remained and Mac sales never achieved the kinds of numbers Apple wanted. Eventually, Jobs recognized the limitations of selling Apple products through third-party retailers and began exploring ways to improve the model. Jobs believed that the Apple retail program needed to fundamentally change the relationship to the customer and provide more control over the presentation of Apple products and their brand message. This new approach to retail required new ideas and a few new employees too. 
1999, Jobs personally recruited Millard Drexler, former CEO of Gap, to serve on Apple's board of directors. In the following year, Jobs hired Ron Johnson from Target. The retail and development teams headed by Alan Moyer from the Walt Disney Company then began a series of mock-ups for the Apple Store inside a warehouse near the company's Cupertino headquarters. But not everyone agreed on how to create a great retail experience. For example, when Ron Johnson shared his idea of including a genius bar for technical support, Jobs blasted the idea, saying, that's so idiotic, it'll never work. Ron, you might have the right idea, but here's the big gap. I've never met someone who knows technology, who knows how to connect with people. They're all geeks. You can call it the geek bar. Johnson replied by pointing out that many of the genius bar workers would be in their 20s and have grown up with the kind of technology they'd be supporting. Jobs told Apple's general counsel to trademark Genius Bar the following day. Although this development process didn't always go smoothly, it led to the creation of a very successful store. On May 15, 2001, Jobs hosted a press event at the Apple's first store located at the Tyson's Corner Center Mall in Virginia near Washington, D.C. The store officially opened on May 19th, along with a second store in Glendale Galleria in California. More than 7,700 people visited Apple's first two stores in the opening weekend, spending a total of $599,000. The vast majority of media publications and analysts thought opening Apple stores was retail suicide, but Apple quickly proved them wrong, bypassing their competition in sales per square foot, and in three years achieved $1 billion in annual sales, the fastest of any retailer in history. But the explosive growth didn't stop there. By 2006, Apple retail stores were generating $1 billion a quarter. In response to all this success, Jobs said that people haven't been willing to invest this much time and money or engineering in a store before. It's not important if the customer knows that, they just feel it. They feel something's a little different. By 2011, Apple stores in the U.S. were generating an average of $473,000 per employee. According to research firm Retail Sales, Apple stores ranked first among U.S. retailers in terms of sales per square foot, almost doubling Tiffany, the second retailer on the list. And on a global level, all Apple stores had a combined annual revenue of $16 billion. Under the leadership of Ron Johnson, the former senior vice president of retail operations, the Apple stores have been responsible for turning the boring computer sales floor into a sleek playroom filled with gadgets. With the success of Apple's own retail stores, they re-established ties with major big box retailers like Best Buy and Staples. Authorized Apple resellers have a dedicated store within a store section, offering a distinctive Apple-style experience to showcase products. The relationship with Best Buy calls for the company to send Apple Solutions consultants to train Best Buy employees to become familiar with Apple's product lineup. Now, Ron Johnson left Apple in 2011 to accept a CEO position at JCPenney, where he executed an extremely unsuccessful retail plan that dropped their store sales by 32%. But that's a story for another time. Back at Apple, Tim Cook began searching for a new senior vice president of retail operations, which took almost a year since they were being very careful to choose someone who was a good match for Apple. It came as a surprise then when John Browett, then CEO of Dixon's, was picked as Ron Johnson's successor. Cook said, I talked to many people and John was the best by far. I think you'll be as pleased as I am. His role isn't to bring Dixons to Apple, it's to bring Apple to an even higher level of customer service and satisfaction. Now, Dixon's is a consumer electronics retailer in the UK and doesn't have a very good reputation. Many people were confused why Apple chose Browett, asking, did he only interview one person? Although Cook was initially confident in his decision, that confidence began dwindling as Browett's changes to Apple's retail stores took effect. Just a couple months after taking the reins, Browett began implementing cutbacks and layoffs in an effort to meet profit goals and encourage the, what he considered, bloated store staffs to run leaner, despite the objections of retail veterans within the company. This led to store employees seeing their hours cut or even losing their job, and caused the store to be understaffed. Apple spokesperson Kristen Hugut eventually admitted making these changes was a mistake and the changes are being reversed. Our employees are our most important asset and the ones who provide the world-class service our customers deserve. Six months after being hired, John Browett was forced to step down and Apple began a year-long search for its next senior vice president of retail operations. 
Apple's patience was rewarded in October 2013 when they hired Burberry CEO Angela Arendt. But Apple changed the retail operations position to retail and online stores since Apple wanted to make the online and retail shopping experience more seamless. Cook said, I'm thrilled that Angela will be joining our team. She shares our values and our focus on innovation, and she places the same strong emphasis as we do on the customer experience. She has shown herself to be an extraordinary leader throughout her career and has a proven track record. This time he was right. Arendt implemented some clever technology at Burberry to improve the customer experience and she was an integral part of the changes Apple made to their Apple stores in recent years. In 2016, Angela Arendt and Jonathan Ive collaborated on a new redesign of Apple stores that was first implemented at the Union Square in downtown San Francisco. The idea was to turn Apple stores into town squares, a gathering place that draws people in naturally and helps foster human experiences that draw people out of their digital bubbles. There were open spaces with touch-sensitive labels and shelves for product displays and rebranded rooms for the store. The Avenue is the central location for hardware as well as for receiving advice from sales associates and individuals with specialized knowledge of music, creativity, apps, and photography called Creative Pros. The Genius Bar became the Genius Grove, a tree-lined area for help and support. The Forum features a large video screen and offers game nights, sessions with experts in creative arts, and community community events. The boardroom lets aspiring developers and entrepreneurs learn how to use their products to their full potential. And the plaza, while limited to select locations, offers a park-like space outside the store featuring free Wi-Fi and occasionally hosts live concerts. There's also Today at Apple Educational Sessions, which offers more than 60 free hands-on sessions for learning different skills using Apple's products and software. The new design will eventually be adopted by every Apple store across the globe. So that is the history of the Apple Store, and if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.